Well, this is the first chat with a chaplain, and this is Paul Arnold, and I'm meeting with Harold Johnson. Uh, I met Harold when I first came here six years ago, and we started talking, enjoying each other's company, um, having some things in common. And I thought I would start with him today, and it's a good opportunity for you to know some of the other residents here at Glacier Hills. So, Harold, thanks for doing this with me. My pleasure. Well, so you have a, um, a wonderful routine or habit. I'm not sure what to call it, but you reach out to new employees and you make them feel at home. And you've done that for years. That just comes naturally by for you, doesn't it? It does. Well, I, I um, respect the employees and I see them, view them as friends or equals. And I just like to be friendly with them. And, you know, they have something to uh, contribute. I think it's the educator in you because you've spent many years in education working with younger people. So for our listeners who haven't met you, could you give a it's crazy to squeeze a whole career into a short sentence or two, but tell me how you got started in education. Well, it, it um, was an accident. An accident? An accident. It was not planned. Uh, it was, uh, when I finished, um, well, let me just say, I, I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, and um, was always interested in politics and people. In, um, we were the only black family in our neighborhood and uh, going to school we were the only black family in the school, the kids. I had uh, two brothers, two older brothers and one older sister. And so it was, um, life was stressful at times, you know, really stressful. I was born in 1926. So grew up and went to elementary school, high school during the depression. In, um, when I turned 18, I joined the army, Canadian army, and I went overseas. I was in Europe, came back in um, late 1946. And I went to college. Uh, we were uh, extremely poor. That may be an understatement. Um, so while I was going to college, I went to a small Catholic liberal arts college that was part of the University of Western Ontario in London. But Assumption College at that time was in Windsor. And I worked the night shift at Ford's. And I, I had the GI Bill, but it was really not enough to live on. And um, so I had, I was supporting my mother at that time. Older siblings were all married and, and uh, moved out. So it was just my mother and myself at home. <clears throat> and um, I got active in a union, the United Automobile Workers, Local 200 in Windsor. And uh, when I finished college, I was scheduled to go to law school. At that time, there was only one law school per province in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And um, in all of Canada, there was one law school per province. So it meant I would have had to go to move to Toronto to go to school. Well, I couldn't move to Toronto to go to school because uh, my mother was living in Windsor and there's no way I could move it. My, um, the Canadian version of the GI Bill, I gave me sixty dollars a month. This is 1945. No, that was by this time it was 1950. Okay. When I finished undergraduate, so, and then they gave me an additional seven dollars and fifty cents a month to support my mother. Whoa. So I had sixty-seven dollars and fifty cents, and I couldn't maintain myself in Toronto and my mother in Windsor. And uh, she was born in the house that we lived in. My grandfather, who was an escaped slave from Virginia, built that house 
and my mother was born in it, and I was born in it, and she wanted to die in it. You know, she was very attached to that house. It was very important to her. So I didn't know what to do. At the time, some of my old friends, when I was a younger kid in high school, I worked in the breweries in Windsor. And some of the guys who worked in the breweries with me at, at that time <clears throat> decided they were going to organize a union. And they knew I'd been active in the, in the UAW, and they came to me and they said, Harold, how about coming back to the brewery and helping us organize a union? I had nothing else to do at the time. So I said, okay. These were old friends and good friends, you know. So um, I went back to work in the brewery. We organized, we were very successful organizing all the breweries in Windsor. There, at that time there were four and a distillery. And uh, then we decided to go province-wide. So we went to the other cities and we organized the breweries in, all through Ontario. And um, we became affiliated with the International Union of Brewery and Distillery Workers, which was headquartered in Cincinnati. Huh. And um, I uh, became president of the local union. And then they made me a special representative of the International Union. And so we went, or we went national and, and started organizing all over. And, and that was kind of fun for me. I enjoyed it and I thought I was doing something constructive. And, and, um, but after a while I got kind of bored and I started doing um, arbitration work for several unions. I was sort of freelancing. And I did that and then I simultaneously I got active in the civil rights movement in Canada and I organized, first of all, I organized in Windsor the Windsor Labor Committee for Human Rights. And then we organized a similar organization in Toronto. And between the two groups we were able to mobilize all of organized labor and get enacted in the early 1950s a Fair Employment Practices Act and a Fair Accommodation Practices Act. In Canada? It, well, for Ontario. For Ontario. Just for Ontario, yeah. And um, then we started, uh, well, I don't know how to phrase it. We, we became concerned that people still had grievances, minorities, uh, blacks, French Canadians, uh, Native Canadians, and Inuit. So we were looking for some other means of, of uh, settling disputes in the community. And uh, ultimately we were able to organize the first ombudsman program in North America. And that became the senior position in government in Ontario. Really? Yes, and was the highest paid position. And we modeled it after the Swedish model of ombudsman. And so uh, one of the fellows who had been active with us uh, in getting uh, the Fair Accommodations Practices Act and Fair Employment Practices Act, his name was Dan Hill. He was a student at the University of Toronto. He was black. He was an American citizen, however. He and his wife, and his wife became active in the um, Toronto Labor Committee for Human Rights, Donna Hill. Dan uh, became the first uh, director of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. The premier at the time said, you know, you're going around raising cane, and if you really want to do something constructive, why don't you come to work for us in the government? Dan said, okay. Well, that's like working for the man. Well, he went for the man, and he, he changed the, everything. He changed the whole damn system. And he was now, very... Wait a second. I told you if you swore, I had to say a prayer. You oh, that's swore. right. I'm sorry. I'll say a prayer later. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> I owe you one. Okay. <laughs> but um, the first uh, ombudsman was the sitting uh, chief justice of the Ontario Supreme Court. He did it just to get it kicked off and that. And then Dan Hill became the second ombudsman. And he, he did that until uh, he retired and really uh, elevated it to uh, you know, international distinction. Mm. Dan had his uh, doctorate in uh, sociology from the University of Toronto. So did you ever think about going to law school yourself? Well, I was articled to go to law school. As I said, that's when I was, when, in 1950, when I graduated. Yeah. I was scheduled to go to law school. I couldn't afford it. Yeah. So, but in Canada at that time, law school is a four-year program. And you had to be what they called articled, which meant sponsored. Oh, okay. By an existing law firm. And I was articled by a firm headed by Paul Martin who was the, uh, a cabinet men member for the uh, Liberal government in Canada. Not Ontario, but for the federal government. And uh, they were, the Liberals were interested in recruiting me to be active, but I was active in the, what at that time we called the Cooperative, Com Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, CCM, which is now the new Democratic Party in Canada. And that's where labor, uh, and, you know, uh, is very active in, in, uh, in the same way that the Labor Party in England is, uh, you know, uh, supported primarily by, by trade unionists. So anyhow, um, while I was working with the unions at one point, we had to call a national strike. This is a long answer, long way to get back to how I got to education. And uh, I didn't know, I was very young and inexperienced. We were gonna have a national strike. I had, had no idea how the hell to run a national strike against numerous companies at the same, simultaneously, you know, across the country. And of course they had a wide array of attorneys and you know, all kinds of people opposing us and all kinds of professionals, you know, who were very dedicated to getting rid of the union. So anyhow, I went over to Detroit and talked to Walter Ruther, who was president of the United Automobile Workers Union and uh, subsequently president of the, uh, and president of the CIO at that time, and then subsequently the, the uh, AFL-CIO. Walter's father had been active in the Brewery Workers Union, so that was my sort of in to him, and uh, he had an, ed, uh, an um, above average interest in the union, you know, because of his father's long term service uh, in Cincinnati. That's where he grew up. So Walter said, um, I can help you, and he loaned me a man, his name was Andy Brown. Andy Brown was a social worker and he was director of community services for the United Automobile Workers Union. He wasn't out of the ranks of the union, he was a, an expert hired by the union to develop and manage their uh, community service programs. So at the time I was representing organized labor on the boards of a lot of social service agencies. And uh, Andy said to me, you know, Harold, if you're gonna dabble in this, it would really be better if you went back to school and expanded your knowledge because you really don't know what you're doing. <laughs> That's a polite way of saying it. <laughs> yeah, well, he said it pretty directly. <laughs> he used a few swear words maybe? Yeah. <laughs> and so Andy said, I will talk to the dean of the School of Social Work at Wayne State University in Detroit. He said, I think you got a lot of potential and it would be good for them and, and good for you. So it wasn't long after that I got a call from uh, the dean. His name was Charles Brink and 
Chuck said, uh, why don't you come over and have a talk with me? And by that time I was, let's see, what is 55? And um, so I would have been 29 years old, which, you know, is a little... You're old man by that time. Yeah, the, the, that's what the kids thought. <laughs> <laughs> and I had maybe 20, 30 years experience, work experience, because I was always working two or three or four jobs. Yeah. And um, so anyhow, Chuck offered me a scholarship to come. And I then went back and talked to the president of the International Union, Carl Feller in Cincinnati. And I said, Carl, you know, I'm getting bored and I think you guys would, would be just as happy if I left. Uh, so why don't we work out an arrangement where I'll work part-time for the union while I'm going through a graduate school. And um, they said, okay. They were just as happy to see me go because I wasn't happy with a lot of things that were going on in the union and was trying to change it and so on. So I had two sources of income. I, had been, I got married in 1953, so I had a my wife, uh, who was working at uh, the Ford uh, office in Windsor, and I had my mother to take care of still. So, I, um, my eyes are running my allergies, excuse me. So anyhow, I uh, went back to school, and on the weekends I would work for the union, I'd run educational programs, you know, like things like contract analysis and uh, how to process grievances and things like that. And um, in the summer I worked for the union. And when I uh, finished, I went to work, when I finished my graduate program, I went to work in Detroit for United Community Services, which was a social planning agency for southeastern Michigan. United Foundation would raise money, the money would go to United Community Services, and United Community Services would distribute it to the various social agencies throughout the metropolitan region. And I was a social planner. One of the things that amazes me about you, Harold, is your memory for names and dates. Like this has been many, many years ago, and you're remembering names like that. Have you always had that ability? Is it a photographic memory or? I don't know. I was always pretty good at it. Yeah, I yeah. think that's helped you in your career, hasn't they, it? They, they used to tell me in the black community, I was like a black minister, black Baptist minister. You know, they knew everybody. <laughs> they, they knew they should have been politicians. Well, maybe you should have come down to some of my worship <laughs> yeah, But anyhow, one of the agencies that we were, that I was responsible for was an agency called Neighborhood Service Organization in Detroit. And it worked primarily with street gangs and the elderly. And um, in 1961, there was a need for someone to go in there and uh, sort of beef up the management of the agency. And my boss, uh, a man named Dick Hughley, who was head of the United Community Services, says, Harold, how about if we move you in there and as associate director and you become sort of the chief operating officer and uh, the man who's the director, Emery Kurtog, um, will be sort of the ambassador in the broader community. So, so we called ourselves Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside. <laughs> So I was this sort of internal manager of the agency. You were the muscles? Well, the I, 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 well I don't know about that. I, I was, I was uh, muscle would be more appropriate than brain <laughs> probably. I had to be tough and um, get some things straightened out. So anyhow, I saw this was an agency that was devoted to innovation. We were interested in finding new ways of serving these two populations, the elderly and delinquent and emotionally disturbed children, teenagers, I mean, rough, tough 
in what year was kids. This? I was 61 I went to that job. One of the things I decided was, you know, there's all these universities around here with a lot of smart, very smart people. Why don't we set up some joint programs, research programs, and find out really, you know, what's going on with these kids and so on, and then with older people. So we started setting up a lot of joint programs. And I found the University of Michigan to be more interested and cooperative than any of the other universities. We had programs with uh, Wayne State, Michigan State, Carleton University in, in Ottawa, Ontario, and Atlanta, uh, University of Georgia in Atlanta. Really? Wow. And um, we used to take about up to 100 students a year for training with us in Detroit, in this one agency. And as the programs expanded, the research programs, and we started getting a lot of federal money for different kinds of programs and so on, the dean of the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan called me one day and he said, you know, Harold, we like what you're doing. Why don't you come and join the faculty of the University of Michigan? And I said, well, I never thought of, I, although I was teaching part-time at Wayne and at the old Mary Grove College in Detroit, sociology classes. And um, I said, I'll tell you what, we, we met and we talked about it, and I said, let me come on part-time and see how you like me and how I like you, rather than entering into some you know long-term agreement. So that was 66. So in 66, I started teaching part-time out here at Ann Arbor, the School of Social Work. And um, I did that until 69. And in 69, we uh, entered into an agreement and I joined the faculty as a full professor. Well, 69 is a pretty tumultuous year. I yeah, mean. well, it was, we had the riots in Detroit in 67. And at that time, I was working in 67, I was loaned to the mayor half time. So I was running the agency, neighborhood service organization, half time and working in the mayor's office half time. Who was mayor back in 67? Jerry Cavanaugh. And um, I set up the um, anti poverty program for them, I set up a delinquency prevention and uh, control program for the mayor for the city of Detroit. It was called Katie Community Action for Detroit Youth. And um, then I started working on some housing problems and uh, some law enforcement problems. And in 69, as I said, we moved to Ann Arbor and I joined the faculty here full time. And then I was here only one term, and I was drafted to go to work for the governor. So then I started commuting from Ann Arbor <laughs> to Lansing for just one year. How old were your kids at that point? They were all in school here. They were young. Uh, one was born in 57, one in 60, and one in 64. Well, one of the things I've enjoyed talking to you about is what's going on in the world. And we're not gonna talk politics in specific, but I think what we're seeing in the world today with social unrest and injustice for African Americans and people of color, I think is something that's beyond political lines as far as I'm concerned, that I think it's a basic human right to be respected and feel protected. Um, and so I've, I've called you in the past month and said, or last couple months, to get your perspective on it, because you're you're being a, a black man from Canada, and then living in the United States and doing a lot of work with civil rights and working with minorities, I was asking your viewpoint because as a white American, I did grow up with privilege, um, with certain advantages that um, people of color didn't have, but I didn't see it as advantages. I just saw it as normal. Yeah, yeah. 
And then my dad started helping me understand that I did have some privileges and he was very intentional. He was a college dean at a community college to let me know that education was the great uh, equalizer for all people, that that can help you rise above. Not everybody had the privileges that we had. But the big difference over the last couple of months was that I always voted my conscience, but I didn't always speak up when I saw injustice. And so I came to you, especially because our community here was struggling with it too. And, you know, just recently in Wisconsin, we have another time of an incident that's happening where um, poor judgment, from my point of view, on the police force was made. So I know there's always going to be accidents, but what do you say to um, people from your perspective, what's really going on right now? Um, and how do, how do you respond to what's going on? First of all, let me say what's going on has been going on and on and on, you know, for hundreds of years. Right. And um, I think the difference at the moment is that for many Caucasians, they are a little more sensitive and have a better understanding of the issue at this point in time than in the past. I still, though, have some of my fellow residents here at Glacier Hills think that uh, things like affirmative action, uh, you know, any, any kind of program that um, is of uh, benefit to minorities is, is probably um, uh, how should I phrase it um, they think it's not necessary um, they there is no under they don't understand what minorities are up against and what they have been up against all their lives you know I heard a great quote, I shared it with you, and it was from an African-American man, and he didn't remember where he heard it, but it said, your opinion is not more valid than somebody else's experience. So that just, I share that with my wife, she says, so true, I have an opinion as a white person, but it's not more valid than a African-American man or a woman's experience being, you know, going through life in America. So I think there's two things going on simultaneously now. There's sort of a greater enlightenment on the part of Caucasians, some Caucasians. And at the same time, I think on the part of minorities, that people have been beaten up for so long and in so many ways physically economically, educationally, health-wise, whatever the issue is, the minorities get the short end of the stick. And they have, and uh, probably will continue to do so in the foreseeable future. There's no, you know, quick solution to, to this problem. It's so deeply ingrained in society. So, I think that as I see the demonstrations and such that are going on now, the protests, there's a much greater participation on the part of whites than in the past. And that gives me some reason for optimism, you know, so I'm optimistic about that. On the other hand, um, the lack of national leadership on these kinds of issues. In fact, it's worse than that. It's, it's anti-progress, um, you know. The, you, you say maybe we shouldn't talk politics, but there's, there's no way to discuss this issue without discussing politics. Um, Mr. Trump yesterday was in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And never once did he mention the man's name, Blake, who was shot seven times in the back. Well, that's one of the things I've had to learn is that for African-Americans, for black people, the saying the name is important because 
saying a name is personal. It's a real life. If you don't say the name, it just becomes a statistic and not so real. Back in the 60s, I remember LBJ wasn't exactly known as a huge civil rights person, and yet he responded and passed some very important legislation back then. Um, because the, the Was that because the nation was asking for it, or did he feel convicted that it was time to... Well, I think it was a combination. I think that was something that, you know, if you've... I've... I got to know him, and uh, I've read a lot about him, and I think he had these deep convictions. You know, he he was a very smart, sophisticated politician. So he took one route to power, but once he got in power, he tried to do some things to improve society, not just for minorities, but I think for all lower income and middle income people. And um, so he, when he had the opportunity to do that, uh, he, he uh, exercised that, that right. The thing is, though, that, you know, like the Voting Rights Act, which was probably the, the most important piece of legislation achieved under his leadership, has been gutted. Mm. So um, most of the gains that were made under the Voting Rights Act of 1965 have been stripped away and, you know, most recently by the Supreme Court. So there now there's legislation in the House right at the moment to uh, um, reinstitute the achievements that were made in 1965. But uh, it's not going to go anywhere as long as uh, uh, the Senate uh, is controlled by the Republicans because they've said openly that, you know, the bill will never come to the floor. Well, you worked for Governor Milliken, yeah. and when I found that out, that reminded me my dad was a huge Milliken fan um, and would talk about Milliken being a statesman and you worked for him, what would you say, was he the favorite politician you worked with? Or tell me, tell me a little about your experience working with Governor Milliken. Well, Governor Milliken uh, was a truly decent human being, just a wonderful person. He was interested in improving the quality of life, I think, for, for everyone. And um, he had a particular interest in fields like education, mental health. Um, I don't think he had any particular interest in civil rights, but he certainly saw people as being equal and treated them that way. And a lot of people, you know, could never understand how he and Coleman Young, the former mayor of Detroit and a former state senator, uh, got along so well, they got along so well because they respected each other, you know, and uh, as human beings. And uh, where they could cooperate, they cooperated. And where they had differences, they discussed those differences openly, but respectfully. And um, so Governor Milliken, in my mind, was just a, a, just a wonderful human being, you know. And I, I enjoyed working with him, and I said to him when I, when I was first invited to go to work for him, I said, Governor, you know I'm active in the Democratic Party, and I'm a Canadian citizen. He said, I'm not hiring you because of your party membership or your citizenship. I'm hiring you for your brains. Not your brawn. Yeah. I said, well, I don't want to embarrass you, because years ago, I, when I was in Detroit, I used to run uh, political campaigns for Mel Ravitz, a former resident of Glacier Hills. Mel was a professor of sociology at Wayne State, and in 1960, I had persuaded him to run for city council, and we were successful. He made it. 
And uh, so one of the first things he did was appoint me to the Wayne County Board of Supervisors. And I said, Mel, not only am I a foreigner, I'm living in Canada. You can't do that. And he said, why not? <laughs> I said, because it'll be the end of your political career. Yeah. That's why not. So I quickly resigned <laughs> for personal reasons yeah. so as not to embarrass him. But I told Governor Milliken about that. And, and I said, I don't want you to get, you know, some of your political opponents, would, that's all they need is, uh, you know, some fodder to uh, attack you. And I don't want that to happen to you. So I took out my uh, citizenship, American citizenship at that point and became a citizen in 1970. One of the best stories or the stories that really stayed with me the most you've told is about President Fleming during some of the civil rights movements. And, and I know there's a bunch of people who live in Glacier Hills who remember him, they probably knew him, but I didn't live through that time. I was very young, I should say. I was very young, I was five years old. But um, tell about why did President Fleming do such a good job during those years? First of all, Bob had the social and political skills to get along with people. He was an a experienced, widely experienced labor arbitrator. And uh, so, you know, part of his skill set was to bring people together and to work out compromises and so on. <coughs> and I knew Bob before I came to the university. I knew him from labor circles. And he was on a, a member of the UAW Public Review Board. But, um, and I had a lot of respect for him, but during the first uh, black action movement strike, we had a sheriff at that time, Doug Harvey in uh, Washtenaw County, who was um, to be kind a Neanderthal. That's kind? That's a kind. And um, at one point, the black kids were lined up on South University and the sheriff's department, and many of their people were lined up opposite the kids. And Harvey was going to open fire on the kids. And Bob Fleming came out of the president's house and he got out in the middle of the street between the two groups. And he said to Harvey, you will have to kill me first. Now that took courage. I went through World War II. I never saw courage like that because Harvey was just as apt to shoot as not. And part of the story about how I got to go to Lansing was that a, a group of us, we decided we somehow have to do something about Sheriff Harvey before this whole town goes up in flames. And I called the governor, I knew him. I called Governor Milliken and I said, you have to get, take over the sheriff's department. And um, he sent in the state police and they took over the sheriff's department. And that, after that, some of us were able to work out a um, settlement between the students and, and the administration. And um, later, Governor Milliken said to Bob Fleming, you know, I was glad to be helpful to you in getting that problem solved in Ann Arbor. He said, I have a problem in, in Lansing right now. I'm running for re-election. He hadn't been elected. At that time, he had been lieutenant governor, and Governor Romney had gone to work for Nixon as secretary of HUD. And so Governor Milliken, Lieutenant Governor Milliken, moved up to governor. So this was his first run for office as governor. And he said, I'd like to borrow Harold for a year. 
So that's how I ended up going to Lansing, and it wasn't uh, wasn't my uh, choice because I just moved to Ann Arbor, right. and my wife was not well, and um, you know it was it was a hardship, really, because uh, I was working. I reorganized all the, uh, there was a new agency created by the state legislature, the Office of Children and Youth Services. I set that up and organized it and I became uh, vice chairman of the State Crime Commission and was running that and trying to get it up and going. And so, you know, was I was working 12, 14 hour days, six, seven days a week, commuting. 150 miles a day. So it was no picnic, but it was, I enjoyed it. It was a good learning experience, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it took its toll on uh, on my family, I think. Yeah. Well, I wanted in our last 10 minutes or so to talk about how another, another tough time, which is right now during COVID, and your experience being a dean of the social work Department, then also gerontology as well. You have experience of how seniors go through, senior adults go through life. Um, how has COVID affected you and how do you think it's affected our community here at Glacier Hills? Well, first of all, you know, the social isolation that um, has been um, necessarily uh, in force here um, has really exacted a toll on people. I think as I talk to people, I, I see a lot of depression, anxiety. Um, some people weather it, you know, better than others, of course. It depends, I guess, the on one's, you know, social relationships, and some people are really isolated because this community is, is all they have. Some of us are fortunate. I, you know, personally, I have friends all over the damn world, and I'm swearing again. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be praying together, Paul, for a long time. Uh, I'm my way. <laughs> but. Um, some people don't have that luxury of having friends. You know, I'm I do, I Zoom and FaceTime and and uh, text and email and so on and so forth. I'm 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 going all the time with people all over. So that really is helpful to you know to me. I still feel that get at times very depressed about what's going on and. And uh, the, again, I think lousy planning or lack of planning that is taking place at the national level so that we're not getting a grip on the situation. I, I mean, my own sense is it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And um, the longer it goes on, I think the um, greater the peril for a lot of the residents here. And it, uh, it brings out the best in some people and it brings out the worst in others. So that you also, you can see a difference in the quality of uh, interaction with people. You know, people, some people flare up. And others are very understanding and supportive. So it, it's very uneven, the consequences, but it's taking a toll on, in some ways, on everyone. But let me, just another example of, we, we don't think of, you know, of the consequences of all this stuff. Reading an article the other day about the building that Dan Gilbert is putting up in Detroit, where the, the old Hudson department store used to stand. Yeah. Now, originally, that was going to be 90 stories. Now, they don't know if they're gonna need that many offices in Detroit. So they're starting to pare it back. We don't know what it's gonna, how it's gonna end up. They, they don't know, they, they're, they're so uncertain about it. 
So the last I heard it was down to about 70 stories, but they wanted for matters of ego, I guess. They want it to be taller than the Wren's end, which is 70 stories. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe it'll be 71. Right. Right. I don't know. But, uh, but you know, things like that, you don't, you don't think about it, you know, the consequences of something like this. Because work, work is going to be changed. The way people work is going to be changed permanently. Right. And uh, whether people be working more from home or from some, you know, other area or the technology is every everything's changing so fast That's it's it's the uh, it's the isolation and the uncertainty the uncertainty is as bad as the isolation no one knows what the hell's going to happen and the same with our political situation you know the uncertainty and it's it's uh, so atypical i mean we've never been the, as a society we've never been tested the way we're being tested now. And well, there's no doubt one of the things I'm concerned about when I go visit people, now that I'm able to visit rooms, is that some of our residents are sitting in the room watching news all day long. It, it could be Fox, it could be CNN, it could be any sort of news, but it's not healthy to sit there and watch news no. all day long. I so I tell my mom, watch 30 minutes of local, 30 minutes of national, and stop. Yeah. Because you're not doing yourself very much yeah, good. Are you, yeah, I, I have cut way back on the news. I'm a news junkie, and I've cut way back because it just leads to depression. Yeah. It's very depressing. Well, Harold, I thank you for your time. Well, I know we could go another hour, no yeah, problem. At least, but wait till you get the bill. Oh, the bill. <laughs> I forgot you had high speaker fees. Huh? <laughs> so, thank you very much. Okay, Paul. It was a pleasure to be with you.